Thanks for listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. since COVID, what we know to be the norm is rapidly changing. In order to adapt to this, your business must adjust and transform accordingly. For pharmacies, unlocking the profession's potential to improve patient care is where this opportunity lies. Today's product-focused role of the pharmacist calls for the industry to move toward clinical services. The focus will be on prevention over treatment, and care will happen in the home or community. As accessible and trusted healthcare personnel, pharmacists can play a big role. Happier at Home harnesses this opportunity by showing the benefits of expanding your pharmacy into home care services and how this is a recipe for success. Innovation and growth will help community pharmacies to continue to exist and thrive in the future. Hey, welcome back to the Happier at Home PRN podcast. Debbie, it's been too long. I can't believe that, I don't know, but it's like that famous song, time keeps slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. Into the future. <laughs> uh oh, that was recorded. <laughs> royalties, royalties. Hey, um, this is a little different. You have shifted some gears for us. We're tapping into a guy that you met and you know, um, and I want you to introduce our special speaker today who's pretty inspiring as I'm reading through some of his bio and information, as well as being a TEDx speaker. So Debbie, I'm turning it back over to you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for everyone joining us today. And I'd like to introduce David Mamano. He is a Rochester born and raised man, entrepreneur, and owner of Mamano, or excuse me, Mamano Ventures. Um, He has started several businesses from scratch, Um, So he has much experience uh, with entrepreneurship, um, both good and bad experiences, and he uses those to make a positive impact uh, on his clients and in the world of business in general. So he has so many things that he's done. Uh, He has experience in comedy, television, radio. He is a podcaster, been doing that for a long time. And so he has uh, a success, including being in um, the magazine 5,000 Growth Company winner, Rochester Top 100 Company, so many things, uh, an adjunct professor at the University of Rochester, 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 which is really incredible. But I'd love to hear more about that from David, but I, um, I really welcome you, David. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Now excited to be on the show. Uh, you know, I've heard good things about you uh, for uh, for years from your uh, sister Lori, and I finally get to kind of meet you over uh, Zoom here, and we'll, we'll have to meet in person. And uh, Todd, nice to meet you yeah. as well. Excited to to add a little different little different uh, uh, ingredient to your uh, podcast recipe today. Great, yeah, and we really would like uh, our audience to be able to draw some information, some tidbits, some advice uh, regarding how they could become more entrepreneurial, how they can use experiences maybe of ours, of yours, uh, that you've had in starting your own business and the things that you consult on in your business uh, to maybe help them to open up and grow their business and look at things that maybe uh, when you, they have their head down at the bench, they're working, that they're not looking at the big picture and uh, opportunities are slipping by them. So uh, can you tell us a little bit of your background with your with your education? Uh, sure. Well, you know, I'm born and bred here in uh, lovely Rochester, Rochester, New York, and uh, graduated uh, Pittsburgh Settle in high school way back in 1987. And uh, I still feel, you know, I would say 18 or 19 some days, but my uh, knees and joints don't don't agree. But I uh, went to college, went to university at Buffalo. Uh, and actually, I started there pre-dental. I was going to be a dentist because, you know, I, I uh, grew up at age 14, saw my cut. My mother's cousin was a dentist. And uh, I, you know, I saw his red Porsche in his big house. And I said, I want to be a dentist, you know. 
uh, ended up doing an internship before uh, the summer before college and realized that I had no love of teeth whatsoever. You know, why the heck did I want to be a dentist? And I realized mm -hmm. it was just for the money and changed my major, went into communications and was actually thinking about being a TV reporter. Um, and so um, I, I ended up the next summer, I did an internship with, uh, at the time, Maggie Brooks, who was our morning show host uh, for uh, NBC, uh, the news and all that stuff. And uh, it was a great experience. Maggie's incredible. The people were incredible. But that's why internships are great. I just realized, like, I don't want to be a TV reporter, you know, like a typical one. I mean, even back then, I mean, being a TV, TV reporter now is brutal, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But back then, this is like 1989. Um it was tough. You know, I mean, it was just, you know, two people quit. One person had a nervous breakdown. Uh, I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this. You know, and then having to travel all over the world or all over the country to, you know, bigger and bigger stations just to succeed. I'm like, eh, I don't know if I want to have my career, you know, have that much control over me. So mm -hmm. I changed my, I, I stayed with communications, <clears throat> ended up working for the college newspaper. This is back when print was still a thing. Uh, mm -hmm. University of Buffalo had a paper that came out three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It was called a Spectrum. And we had actually had, a, every time we published, we had a circulation of 13,000. You know, UB is a pretty big school. Yeah. And um, so our claim to fame was we were the second biggest paper in Buffalo <laughs> and uh, second to the Buffalo News. And uh, so uh, loved it, loved writing, loved selling ads. And that became my thing. I really became like, a good ad salesperson became the ad sales manager for the newspaper. Still like to write, but sales, advertising sales really was was getting me excited. So after college, I uh, I applied to radio stations and TV stations, thought I would, you know, this is before the internet. So, you know, the media kind of was, you know, print, radio, TV. Uh, so I ended up getting a job here in Rochester in radio, selling radio advertising. Uh I did that for a year. And uh, during this time, I should also add that I was doing stand-up comedy uh, just for fun. You know, I entered a comedy contest at University of Buffalo. Didn't win, but definitely caught the bug. Uh, and then started doing in Buffalo and Rochester um, open mic nights, comedy contests, all that stuff. Uh, so when you're out of college, um, I, try, you know, I, I, uh, uh, enter the funniest person in Rochester contest. And you have to be oh, an awesome. Right? And uh, believe it or not, I won. And uh, you know, local comedian Sky Sands was the host. And he's like, you're pretty good. You should think about doing this, you know. So I had a buddy in Chicago that was actually trying to be a comedian and an actor. And I went to go visit him. And I'm like, I got to try this. So I quit my job in radio, that first job, and moved out there. And, uh, you know, took classes at yeah, Second City and Improv Olympics and uh, did open mic nights and acting lessons and all that stuff. And did that for about a year. And, uh, you know, I liked it, but I, I was like, I don't know if this is my calling. I don't know if I'm going to have the endurance to try, you know, open mic nights and traveling around the country for 15 years to see if I, you know, I'm supposed to be the next Jerry Seinfeld, right? So I mm -hmm. ended up moving back. I said I would do it as a hobby. Uh, and, 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 and then I moved back out of job at radio again for two years and really didn't do comedy again until lately. Um, you know, uh, because then, you know, job, marriage, kids, all that stuff takes over. And uh, so um, ended up being in radio again for two more years where I decided that, you know, I uh, um, I like my boss. I just hate having a boss. And uh, I, then I started thinking maybe I'm just supposed to be an entrepreneur. And I started thinking about ideas that I could do to launch a business that were you know kind of consistent with what I like doing anyway, hobbies, values. And you know, I, I volunteered with three organizations that helped young people with their future. You know, I was a comp peer, which is similar to the Big Brother, Big Sister program, uh, Junior Achievement, and then uh, Camp Good Days, which is a camp here in the Finger Lakes for kids with cancer. I'm like, maybe I should do something that helps uh, young people with their future. Uh, and I remember that I loved the school newspaper. I loved the UB, it was called The Spectrum, loved it. And uh, so then I had the idea to start a printed magazine for high school students to help them with college, career, and life planning. So it all kind of tied in. And it was 1995. So again, print is still a thing. You know, Al Gore had just invented the internet, I believe, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so 95, and I'm 25. And uh, so I launched this magazine and uh, very local uh, here in Rochester. We uh, it was a beautiful magazine, uh, great articles. 
Um, and, and it was free to the students. We would give it out free in bulk to, to local high schools. And the way we made our money is, is selling advertising. Mm-hmm. So mostly like local colleges, uh, banks for student loans, the military. Mm-hmm. And um, and so, you know, uh, I think we printed 10,000 copies, the first issue, right? And then um, made, made a profit by the third issue. So we, like all entrepreneurs do, and, you know, for any of uh, the your, your listeners who may not consider themselves entrepreneurs, but you are. <laughs> I think everybody has to have the entrepreneurial mindset in today's world. And that includes, you know, how how am I going to grow, right? How am I how, not just exist? How am I going to grow? You can only coast for so long. So it's kind of the entrepreneurial, you know, drug of like, how am I going to grow this thing? So we expanded to Buffalo and Syracuse. And then the next year we expanded to all New York State. You know, so now we're printing like 70,000 copies. We're in like 1,500 high schools all over New York. And now it's a real business. I could quit my two night jobs at uh, restaurants, Ruby Tuesdays Mm -hmm. and Mario's. And I'm a (laughs) full-time publisher, you know, full-time CEO publisher. Um, You know, eventually got to hire some people to help out and all that great stuff. Um, But then I wanted to, you know, continue to expand, right? Uh, That drive, you know, that fire, you know, as an entrepreneur, you always have a goal, like, what's the next thing? What's the next thing, you know? And uh, so I wanted to go nationwide. But then, you know, most of my advertisers were colleges that would recruit in the, in mainly in the New York State area, or the surrounding area, you know, University of Utah was not advertising in my magazine, right? Because, you know, not too many New York students, you know, would go to Utah or vice versa. So if I just had one big addition, I would lose most of my advertisers, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because St. Bonaventure uh, University doesn't do too much uh, recruiting in Utah, right? So I was mm-hmm. like, I, I I can't have just one national edition because uh, I would lose the core of what I built. Uh, so we decided uh, to do um, regional uh, additions. And the way I decided to do that was franchise. So I set up a separate company to be a franchise corporation. And I franchised the magazine in different states and regions. And it took us about three years, but we ended up uh, having an edition in every state, even Hawaii That's and Alaska, cool. which is pretty cool. Right. And, That's uh, cool. And so, uh, so in what we did is we printed together and we we did, I mean, anybody remembers the print industry, you could do, if you're printing at the same time, you could do like a shared 16-page signature among all the different editions. So what we would do is we would sell some national advertising together. So, you know, uh, like, you know, the Marines or Citibank Student Loan would advertise in all the editions. We had some regional advertisers as well. Um, and then we did just have statewide advertisers. So uh, mm-hmm. what was cool is I would I would get, you know, franchise fees from all the franchisees. But we also essentially became freelance salespeople for each other, too, selling ads in each other's magazines, too. You know, so, for instance, my my franchise in Texas you know, he owned all those colleges, right, as far as the rights. But if University of Texas wanted to advertise in New York State, I would take his mag- I would take his ad in my magazine and give him a commission and vice versa. So, yeah. so, and I didn't even plan that. That just kind of happened. I'm like, oh, this is a cool little after effect, you know? So you never know by growing, you know, some of the other things that are going to happen. So, you know, right. we grew that. I ran the magazine, you know, uh, 21 years, you know, from 95 and then 2016, um, I sold it. And the reason is, you know, the digital revolution was finally just kill and print. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, so I put it online and then I sold it to a, a woman in New York City who wanted to continue more of the digital marketing aspect of the business, you know? Mm-hmm. So, Very good. Uh, yep. So I, I hear your story and I think about um, being an entrepreneur. And at some point, you have to really sit back and see what and and ask yourself is this just my fun and my vision or is it what the market's asking for and uh knowing how to um pivot and maybe um you know just go into regional and looking at okay my business model was local um but to be able to grow and expand I need to pivot into perhaps a franchise model. So sounds like you did a great job. It's really exciting. And, um, you know, I connect with hating having a boss. (laughs) So, um, you know, that's another part of being an entrepreneur, you know, having that freedom and being able to really, you have your, maybe your destiny, but 
being yeah. able to make those, um, having that free will to make your decisions on how you're going to get to your destiny. Yeah. And sometimes you just have to, you know, as Steve Jobs says, you have to think different. You know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, there are dentists that uh, kind of got bored with the industry of being a dentist, but they would invent a product, yeah. you know, that they could sell. Right. I mean, that's how Invisalign started. Right. And I know the dentist mm -hmm. locally. Uh, he made it. He made a gazillion bucks. I think it was like three months smiles. He called or something like that. It was kind of the predecessor to Invisalign. But it was a similar product that, uh, you know, um, you could put in your mouth and with three months, within three months, your teeth were a lot straighter without braces. And he made a fortune. You know, because he's kind of getting sick of being a regular dentist, you know, um, even just different industries. You know, we go to if you go to Wegmans, which is, you know, for those of you that don't live in the Northeast, Wegmans is like the best grocery store ever. But I'm sure uh -huh. there are a lot of grocery stores. You know, if you're uh, when, when you're buying pasta and you're looking at the bottled sauce right behind it, uh, there is a sauce company called uh, Rouse, R-A-O-S, Rouse, right? And it's like eight bucks a bottle, right? Very expensive. Uh, but, um, from what I understand, we make my own, my, you know, my own sauce, but it's even like people that don't like jarred sauce, like think it's really good. Mm -hmm. And what I just learned is, uh, Rouse is a, um, it's a small little Italian restaurant in New York city in Manhattan that, it, you know, it has like 20 seats and you have to make reservations like months, months, months in advance. And the only way they, they could grow traditionally was to open up another restaurant, which they didn't want to do. So someone said, hey, why don't we just buy all our sauce and sell it at a premium, you know, because it's really good sauce and people that don't like ragu and prego and they're willing to pay, you know, eight bucks a jar instead of three bucks a jar, whatever it is. And uh, mm -hmm. and they're killing it. So, yeah. you know, they so they kind of looked at things a little bit differently as far as a, a different way of growing their business, you know, and I think that's probably a good idea for for your pharmacist to think about, like, you know, what can they do to grow their business without just thinking with their, you know, traditional pharmacist mindset, you know? Debbie, that's exactly what you and I talk about all the time. It's, it's, it's using what David has done. If we used his website as a public relations and marketing model for every pharmacist in the nation, they would be better off because they would have some kind of authority in a blog, an authority that they've created a book they're being outsourced as a speaker about hyperlipidemia or diabetes or the expert in their community about you know aging adults and the need that they have that are very special needs so what you've done david is you've created a multifaceted model of yourself so that you can plug into other things to get more out of you than just having a boss and doing one job and collecting a paycheck and that entrepreneurial spirit spills out into the community pharmacists and pharmacies because now they have an opportunity to reinvent themselves and their services that we know that the community needs, but it's just the way that you package it. And if it's spaghetti sauce or if it's, you know, healthcare services, it's really as long as you're marketing it the right way. So that's why I'm impressed with your website and what you've done in being multifaceted and showing up on TEDx and publishing your book and showing up on on the news and like a community pharmacy has to take that business model or that way of thinking that you've done it and kind of rinse and repeat. Yeah, I mean, you know, how can they become the thought leader in their community? You know, how could they become the the uh, authority in their community where uh, and so so I, I live in Victor, New York, where I can have easy access to a lot of national change chains of pharmacies we won't we won't mention them uh i can even go to wegmans right which you know at the end of the day they're a good pharmacy too yeah. right uh but i choose to go to uh my local it's called mead square pharmacy in victor guy's name is chris casey because i know him i like him and i trust him he lives in my neighborhood actually yeah. and so i know that you know i uh, uh in fact um i i got the vaccine for i'm forgetting the name of it um when you turn 50, you're supposed to get it because it's that, that like thing Shingles. that can, what's that? Shingles. Yes. Yeah. Shingles. So yeah. I'm like, I, I don't get a lot of vaccines, but I'm like, I'm getting the shingles one. Cause I, that thing looks horrible. Right. <laughs> but I, I got it. And, uh, and the first one is it's a two prong vaccine. Right. And so I got the first one. I was fine. The second one I was feeling, it was a weekend and I was like feeling really like tired, melancholy, 
And I, I was able to call Chris directly. I have a cell number. And I was like, Chris, what's going on? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. The second one off and you, you will feel like that. You feel melancholy. And it's going to last another day or two and then you'll be fine. Totally normal. Just chill out, relax, catch up on Netflix. And I did. And, uh, you know, he was right. Two days later, I was fine back to my normal, crazy, spazzy energy. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it was just great to be able to call a friend. And uh, and and that is, separates him from all the other pharmacies that, that are that are out there because he's my resource. He's my expert. He's my he's my trusted friend, you know. And uh, so what else could he do? I mean, Chris, um, you know, I, I think he's probably looking to kind of retire soon. Um, but uh, but if somebody was like, you know, let's say, you know, in their prime of starting a, or running a independent pharmacy, what could they do? You know, to Todd's point, you know, could they do more speaking in the industry? Could they write books? Could they do a podcast? Right. And uh, and just really get to be known as like, you know, the guy, the gal that is going to be more than just someone who takes your order and hands you a bunch of pills. Right. How, you know, right. How can they be more than that? Right. And uh, and then it becomes more of an engaging career, too. You know, mm -hmm. and that's probably why they originally got into it, because they wanted to help people. I'm just thinking. You. you know what? To to your point about uh, entrepreneurial minded people uh, looking at what their loves are, their hobbies, the things that they're really interested in, turning that into a business. Uh, our pharmacy owners can do that as well. It doesn't have to be just focused on medications. Um, there can be something that they're really interested in in their own life and tie that into their pharmacy and bring that out as a new product, a new offering, a new line of service. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our pharmacy owners are really very interested in giving back to their community and increasing the quality of care. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the reasons we offer our Happier at Home franchise model uh, to them so they could like hit the ground running. You know what it's like to start a business from scratch. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, you make the, you have to make all the mistakes. You have to do trial and error. You have lots of tests that you have to um, go through to know what the right formula is. But with a franchise model, it's right there for you. So um, that's one of the ways that they could uh, expand and help out with their community and uh, increasing the accessibility of care to their clients as well. But to your point about Chris, I, I actually uh, started using them as well. And he does some compounding for me. And the first thing that he did uh, showing up as a new patient, he came right out and introduced himself to me. Yeah. So I see that though, only in our independent community pharmacies yeah, yeah, where yeah. you they're making that that connection with yeah. uh with our the community of themselves so being yeah. able to really um eh, to be able to reach into the community and know what's going on with the other family members to know where they could expand and how they could help those people as well yeah i'm just thinking like i'm putting myself in their mindset like if i owned a pharmacy right i would go insane by just filling pills and, and handing them over the counter. I would want to do more, yep. right? And I would think to myself, all right, really pharmacy is about health and wellness, right? You go, I mean, Chris has a lot of stuff in, in, his, in his, it's also like a general store almost, you know, where there's mm -hmm. a lot of vitamins and supplements and other products to help you. I mean, if I was a pharmacist, I'd probably say, hey, um, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm really going to focus on, on, uh, on just general wellness too, you know, like helping people, um, stay well. So maybe they, they, you know, it might be a little counterculture, but uh, counterintuitive, I should say, but stay well so that maybe they won't need medications. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, to so say, I'm going to start a biking club, right. In my community or a hiking club or a walking club or whatever, showing that you truly care about them. And then inevitably when they do, you know, get the flu or have some type of illness or need a vaccine for shingles, they're going to go to that person. Right. You know, because they know that, you know, they they uh, they have the best interests at, at, at heart, you know. So, um, I mean, that's what I would do is just try to engage with the community from a wellness perspective. You know, how can I maximize your health? That's what I'm here for. I'm here for the good times and the bad times, you know, so. Something different. I like that idea of yeah. groups that are not just focused. I mean, our medicine, of course, is 
uh, mostly focused on putting a Band-Aid on things and not at the root of the problem. So prevention, uh, that goes along with uh, yeah. prevention. So I, I love that idea. I mean, I have um, a friend of mine who is a doctor. He's a medical doctor, right? He used to be a traditional doctor that people would go to when you were sick. And it and then it drove him nuts, you know. So he he totally changed his practice. Like he still does that. Like if you're sick, you could go to him. But the focus of his practice now is, you know, setting up, you know, habits uh, and strategies so that they don't get sick. Hmm. <laughs> you know, eat well, exercise well. Like you know, so that's the core of his practice. And yeah, when they do get sick, when something happens, they you know, in his he's doing like. He's not cannibalizing his business. He's not hurting. He's growing his business uh, because he's he's coming from a very good place of like, well, let's keep you healthy. Right. And, you know, it, and at some point, unfortunately, you're probably going to, you know, need me for the bad news. And I'm here for that, too. But, you know, uh, now you become a complete trusted friend, a complete resource uh, to your customers. And they're not going to get that at CVS. They're not going to get that at Rite Aid, right? And they just want to like, no. you know, pump you full of pills. That's it. They don't care about, you know, the fact if, you know, you stay healthy, right? And right. Uh, I'm just thinking about ways, in, you know, and I'm, and maybe I hope I'm everything I'm saying is okay, but I'm just thinking off like, you know, the top of my head, what I would do if I was a pharmacist. And that would be to create uh, more of a, of a, of a wellness partner, you know, mm -hmm. in the community. I just think of myself as a pharmacist. More streams, those those streams of revenue for them as well, because yeah, it's yeah, part of their problem yeah, having that yeah. Uh, yeah. additional source of revenue uh, because of the re reduced reimbursements that they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, so as an, uh, an entrepreneur, after your 21 years in your publishing business, um, how did you then make a transition into being uh, another business owner. Did, is that then when you started your consulting business? Yeah, I started a company after uh, called Avanti, which means next step in Italian. It really means move forward. But I'm like, oh, it's a nice name. I'm, you know, my grandparents are from Italy. And uh, I said, it'd be cool to come up with like a name that was similar to next step, you know, for my magazine. So Avanti, Avanti means move forward. So I started doing coaching, consulting programs. I would do a lot of speaking um, and events for entrepreneurs. I would have monthly events for entrepreneurs. That's how I met your sister, actually. She joined Avanti. And it was like a monthly networking group where I'd bring in speakers and we do networking and all that stuff. Um, and that started going really well. And then we started setting up groups in different cities. Uh, but then COVID hit and obviously, you know, uh, in-person events weren't happening. We went online, but I think you know, people were just getting sick of online. And, and really the core benefit of, of Avanti was being face to face with people, good old fashioned belly to belly, I call it, you know, like we love right. that. And uh, so, um, so then I, I, uh, I just, during COVID, I started doing more consulting projects, you know, continued my podcast. Um, and it's just really has evolved into, you know, as, as you, you know, are probably well aware, we all have one or two God given talents and how do we, you know, sync up with those and, and create value. And uh, so for me, it's, you know, I love podcasting. I love hosting events, right? Hosting podcasts, shows, events, and speaking. Um, so I'm that, that's the core of what I want to do. And yes, I still do some coaching and consulting, you know, uh, where, where I'm good at it, you know, uh, and that certainly, that certainly helps pay the bills too. So, but, uh, right. you know, if I had my druthers, if I could pick one thing, I would say, hey, uh you know, let me uh, let me be. Do uh, you guys know Rick Steves, that that travel ho that travel guy? Ever heard of Rick Steves? I do not. Uh, so he he goes to different cities and he uh, gives like a travel tour of those cities, right? Kind of oh, like okay. you know, Anthony Bourdain, you know, God rest his soul. He focused on food. He would go to different gotcha. cities and be and talk about food. I would go to different cities and I would be uh, the host of capturing that that city's entrepreneurial ecosystem. Oh, so, that'd be very cool. That's, yeah, where I'm, mind, that's where my that's where my mind's going at the young age of fifty five for the for my next twenty years. So <laughs> that would be very exciting, actually. I love that yeah. though that you you can just, um, as you said, um, syncing up your talents to making money. You know that yeah. that's what I tell my kids all the time. I'm I just turned fifty six, by the way. And I our children, but yeah. I'm telling my kids all the time, I don't want you to choose something because I want you to choose something to do in your life. I want you to 
uh, look at what you enjoy doing and try to build something around mm-hmm. what you enjoy doing. Try to, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is tough being an entrepreneur sometimes, but I can't imagine it any other way. So I think about that with my children too. And mm-hmm. when, you know, three of the four of them want to be entrepreneurs, I'm like, oh, well, that's my fault. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, and, and I, I, my message to them would be, you know, find, you know, your innate God-given talent and how can you create, how can you, instead of like just saying, how do you make money with it? You could say, you know, how can you, how can you create value with that talent? Okay. And you can figure that out, you know, the money will come, right? Was that movie? Yeah. Uh, build it and they will come, uh, you yes. know, uh, you know, so feel the dreams, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you build it, they will come. If you, you know, if you can get in touch with your value and and turn that in or your gift, turn that into value for others, they'll pay you for it. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah. Look so, at Todd over here. He's a, you know, 10 out of 10 expert podcaster. Look, look what he's done. Right. So. Pretty yeah. incredible. Yeah. <laughs> check out his website. It is. And, and I have to believe Todd that you love what you do because you seem happy all the time. You don't mind uh, traveling and doing exactly what you're doing at these conferences that I see you at and that we engage in. Um, so it is uh, a, a lot of fun and you've been able to really capture something you love and turn it into a business, but really something so important to help others. It's the network. It's, it's not about podcasting at all. I always say that I've, I've, I've branded this and now it's the biggest podcast in our profession about pharmacy because of the collective, because of all the expertise. I'm not a pharmacist. I'm not a clinician, but the insiders are, and these people that are coming to our network are, that's why I love having people like David on the show, because he's bringing an expertise of something that he's passionate about doing that our pharmacy entrepreneurs, whether that is you own a pharmacy or David, there's a, out of our 300,000 active pharmacists in the United States right now, there's this 10% of these high risers that are starting to build their own businesses out of ether, out of nothing that they've just created something as a vitamin lines or experts on, on cardiovascular health or experts in diabetes, where they're becoming these consultant and sources that they're becoming little brands in of themselves. And um, we we have a publication or we have an awards program called the Pharmacy 50. And it's our, we're in our fourth year coming up. And we always pick out by the by the cohort, by the, the profession itself, who's doing things that are just standing out, you know, way out front in building their businesses. And I can't tell you how many people that are following in your footsteps, David, of what you've done to rebrand yourself in order to um, help others, but you're also have multiple lines of being able to do that through your publication. And I find it interesting that you went from print and you made this transition to podcasting into digital and to speaking and to, I mean, that's, that's the success model in and of itself of what it means to be an entrepreneur is the self reinvention yep. and the, in the constant growth. And if you stop as an entrepreneur and grass starts to grow around you, you're going to die off because something else is going to competitiveness or the PBMs or the way that you get paid or something will dry up. And if you don't keep moving, um, you know, it's going to, it's going to implode in some ways. You got yeah, falling behind. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a big audio book guy. So if you could see this, but I'm, I'm listening to this book right now, how to be like Walt. And what you just said, Todd and, and Debbie is uh, exactly what, you know, Walt did the, the, the epitome of entrepreneurs. This guy was in, he could have been in the boxing match with that uh, Russian guy from Rocky <laughs> yeah, I mean, he just got pounded left and right, and he went bankrupt. Uh, his first company went bankrupt. His second company, uh, the the guy that he produced uh, uh, his his first uh, movies for, uh, the guy uh, stole the main character before Mickey Mouse. Before Mickey Mouse was Oswald the Rabbit, stole that main character and took like almost all of uh, Walt Disney's uh, designers, right? illustrators mm-hmm. and Walt uh, next day came out with Mickey Mouse and the rest is history. Right. So he kept on going, he, you know, instead of being defeated, being like, Oh, you know, I just lost my company, all my designers, et cetera. My main character, 
um, he he was on a train and just said, all right, and I got to do something else and started drawing Mickey Mouse. So, and even then he had more, yeah, he continued, he continued to get pummeled, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's more mm -hmm. like, that's okay. You know, like what's next? So, so he, that is an excellent point with everyone that I know as an entrepreneur with every large business, I know there have been challenges and maybe it seemed like it was the end at that time or um, my goodness, what am I going to do? That was a door that they could step through and start something completely different or uh, look at things in a different way that maybe this was supposed to be your path. Is yeah. there anything that you could think of that uh, as an entrepreneur you felt was a huge challenge or a huge loss, and then it came to be it as a blessing eventually. Oh yeah, I mean, there's there's dozens of examples. You know, I mean, I think the biggest one was you know the the digital revolution killed print. Mm -hmm. You know, that was my Oswald the Bunny, Oswald the Rabbit. You know, yeah. And, uh, and so then you have to say, all right, well, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. You know, work for somebody else. Like, what else can I do here? And I just came up with a different idea. Um, you know, so. There's been situations where, you know, you just run out of money as an entrepreneur and you're forced to be like, all right, I need to come up with an idea to bring in, you know, $10,000 in two weeks. Yeah. And you know what? You do it. Right. And, <laughs> you know, and uh, so it's just, you know, it's just uh, the, the entrepreneurial mindset is like, you know, giving up is not is not an option. And you'll, you just have to, um, you know, find a different way. You know, when the door is when the door is locked, you know, can you go through the window? Right. Uh, or can you, you know, or do you have to like literally kick down the wall? But you find a way, you know, if you're committed, Tony Robbins said this um, and I love it. It's, a, it's a saying that I always say to myself, um, if you're fully committed, you will always find a way. Yes, and that's true. Agreed. It's, you know, like, yeah. you know, you will you just don't give up and you'll just keep on thinking, thinking, thinking and something something's going to happen. You know, I mean, yeah. Walt Disney getting screwed over by, uh, you know, that that gentleman who took his main character and most of his illustrators um, turned out to be like the biggest blessing in disguise. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, imagine, you know, going to Walt Disney Park and uh, being excited about Oswald the Bunny. No, I mean, like <laughs> Mickey Mouse. I mean, like, come on. Right. So um even the name was different it was like what was the name at first it was something else mouse it's coming to come to me it was like manitoba uh, mouse. um it was tugboat willie it was a tugboat yeah like totally different name and his wife was like no 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 that's you gotta do like mickey like because they they liked uh mickey Rourke, or not mickey Rourke. who was that little child actor at the time mickey uh, uh um not yeah mickey. it'll kind of be but uh, he was a, he was a yeah, little yeah. child actor and she liked him she's like what about mickey mouse and he was like ah oh, that's better <laughs> It's easy to remember. Good name. Just like yeah, happier. You know, so, so that that kick in the you know what turned out to be the best best blessing uh, that happened to him. I see that all at, the time. You look at that uh, for those of you that are, uh, you know, 50 plus. Right. I mean, you remember, you know, like Lee Iacocca. Right. Like so Lee Iacocca, who was the savior of Chrysler and reinvented the car industry. He worked for Ford. Right. And uh, I think it was Henry Ford, the third or something, got jealous of him and fired him. Fire, he's out of a job, out of a job, you Bad know, move. Chrysler picks him up and, uh, and that, yeah, that was not a good move for Ford, right? So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so mm. you get knocked down and you get it back up again. That's, you just yeah. keep on, keep on persevering until you yeah. reach your goal. Well, if you're so. feeling down, just watch, you know, watch a few Rocky movies. That's right. You'll be back on track in no time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it's a, a serious thing. I mean, so many of our pharmacy owners are in that. They're feeling that crunch, feeling it every day being so difficult of how am I going to pay my bills? Am I going to get paid this month? Yeah. Uh, when is, you know, are they going to claw back more money from me? Mm -hmm. So um, it is a very serious thing. And you just have to just know it's not going to kill you. You mm -hmm. have to get yourself, pick yourself up and find a way, find these different streams, yeah. find different businesses, add on to your business and just keep, keep persevering. Yep. Keep on swimming. Keep yeah. swimming. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Love that movie. Right. Well, I tell you what it, 
There's a lot going on right now, Debbie, in community pharmacy. There's opportunities to grow your business using the footprint that you've already built and not really necessarily reinventing yourself, but reinventing the business that you offer to the community that's in the some of the highest demand with the increase in our uh, geriatric and senior populations and how happy you're at home is at the key of that. Um, I want to give a shout out to our listeners. If you're going to the NCPA 2024 Annual Convention and Expo, October 26th through 29th, Debbie will be there. Happier at Home will be there. Please schedule time with her. Uh, sit down and let's do some strategy talking about how are we going to expand your community pharmacy in your community through a Happier at Home franchise. But Debbie, um, I'm getting excited about uh, Columbus uh, coming up in October. I am too. I'm very excited. I, you know, I love when people come together and there's such energy uh, and especially with the NCPA, there are so many different types of, uh, you know, we're all coming together to, for one purpose, to learn, make connections, grow, uh, but it's all for the greater good of our independent pharmacy community. So um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to connect with many people there. Uh, you want to learn more about how it is and understand the business model and how it would work with your community. Uh, I would love to meet with you. Uh, you could reach out to me in advance as well. Uh, and you could reach me on my email address, Debbie at happieratthome.com. Uh, certainly happier at home franchise.com will give you a lot of information, but uh, I like making the personal connection. So I welcome the uh, conversation and a meeting to meet in person in October as well. Me too. And David, um, I think the NCPA would be, um, would be awesome if you'd speak there someday. So maybe this is a way that we could bring you back to our community pharmacy owners and, and you'll be a speaker at, at one of these national conferences, the National Community Pharmacists Association. I would love it. I can I can certainly uh, do that and be happy to try to get them to go forward with an entrepreneurial mindset for sure. That's right. Big. All one. why providing comedy too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take my years of uh, stand-up comedy, and I'll, what, you know, if you don't, if you can't make an audience laugh these days, then you're you're, you're going to lose them. So I I definitely intertwine my lessons with some laughs. So <laughs> excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I do look forward to uh, connecting with you in person too. So let's definitely get that on the calendar. Sounds great. Okay. For more information, reach out to Debbie on LinkedIn or happieratthomefranchise.com. Once again, that's happieratthomefranchise.com. Thank you for listening.